Hey Eagle fans, it's Eagle Fan Carl. This is going to be my reaction to that terrible game that was on Sunday, the tie against the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, and it felt a little bit like Groundhog Day because I was at that Bengals tie in 2008 and it just seemed very reminiscent of brutal game to watch in which our coach was absolutely terrible. Uh, so, uh, you know, it was just one of those bad games. We're now 0-3-2 against the Bengals this century. That's right, one of the worst teams in the NFL. We've never beaten them, and we've tied them twice. Uh, that is, uh, that is the Eagles right now against the Bengals, and that's the way this Eagles team is right now. It's just terrible. So who do I blame most? Who's going to be my number one dud this week? It's going to start with Doug Peterson, and there's lots of reasons I could criticize Doug, but there's really only two I'm going to focus on. First of all is going to be, uh, his play calling. Uh, and the absolute uh, terrible decisions that he was making as it related to the run versus the pass. I don't know why you're not running the ball more for multiple reasons. Uh, number one reason is your quarterback struggling right now. What better way to get him some confidence than get the offense going by running the ball and then you can use play action off of that to hopefully get him uh, some opportunities to build his confidence. The second reason uh, that um, I don't understand why he wasn't doing it is because against this defense, which was terrible against the run, it would have made sense to do it. But number three is you've got Miles Sanders, who's probably your best player on offense, uh, clearly right now. Uh, when he did run the ball, he was averaging over five yards a carry, and yet he only carried the ball 18 times in a game that went 70 minutes long. That's just unforgivable, and the play calling by Doug in this game was absolutely terrible. But the other reason I've got to criticize Doug is the fact that where did aggressive Doug go? Where did the guy that called the Philly special on fourth down in the Super Bowl go? Uh, this was a game where it was clear he was playing not to lose, and look what ended up happening. Yeah, you didn't lose, but a tie almost felt just as bad. Uh, and there was multiple opportunities they had to potentially be a little more aggressive and try and win this game. First of all, at the end of regulation, I actually would have gone for two. I know ultimately hindsight's 2020, but at that moment, I didn't trust our defense was going to be able to stop them in overtime based on how the second half went. So I didn't want to risk it on a coin flip uh, that they were going to be able to uh, stop uh, the Cincinnati offense. Uh, so that's number one reason why I would have uh, gone for two. And number two, the other reason is our offense actually had a little bit of momentum going at that point. So why not build off of that and go ahead and go for two and try to win the game right there? Then in overtime, they had opportunities to just try and get into field goal range uh, instead of trying to go for home run balls where they could have just got, gotten a little closer and tried a long field goal. And then, of course, the ultimate bad time in terms of not being aggressive is at the very end with 20 seconds left. Nobody has it. Neither team has any timeouts. Uh, you've got the false start that pushes you back. And then what do you decide to do? You decide to punt, which guarantees that you're going to tie that game and you've got no shot at winning. You know, you had three options there. Option number one was going to be go ahead and try the 64-yard field goal uh, and let Jake Elliott have a shot at it. Uh, option number two is you try and go for it on fourth and 12 and actually convert the ball, get run up, spike it, and then try the field goal. Or option number three was you punt the ball. Guess what? The first two of those gave you an opportunity to win the game. The other one was going to give you no opportunity to win the game. And guess what? Since Cincinnati had no timeouts left, it was going to be very unlikely, even if you did give them good field position, that they were going to be able to go the length of the field in, what, 19 seconds? Or actually, probably more like 12 or 13 seconds that would have been left at that point. Uh, they aren't going to be able to go and score. So you're probably going to end up with a tie anyway. To try and take the chance to win the game uh, with one of the other two options. Either would have been better than what Doug on, on, ended up deciding to do. I know Doug comes out the next day and then he says, in hindsight, I should have done something different. But at that point, where did aggressive Doug go? Where is he in that moment? The guy that made the Philly special call, where is he right there? Because that was just absolutely ridiculous what they ended up doing in that game. But let's go ahead and talk about some studs and duds because there were some guys that I think do, should be recognized for how well they played. And I've got a long list of duds. I actually had to cap it at eight. Uh, there's that many guys I want to blame for this game. So uh, first of all, we'll do this sort of lightning round. For the studs, uh, stud number four is going to be the Bengals kicker. If he doesn't kick the ball out of bounds right before half, we probably aren't close enough to really try and go for that uh, touchdown right before half. So that was really a gifted seven points to us, all thanks to the Bengals kicker. He's my number four stud of the week. 
My number three stud of the week is going to be Greg Ward. Uh, he's the only receiver that's showing up these days. Uh, he has the touchdown catch, and ultimately he ends up uh, being one of the more productive players for us on offense, so Greg Ward is going to be my number three stud of the week. My number two stud of the week is going to be probably our best player on offense, like I was talking about earlier, Miles Sanders, uh, who absolutely had a great game and should have been given the ball more. So he's my number two stud of the week. For my number one stud of the week, uh, this, is, this is how bad this team is, because he's going to make the stud list for two weeks in a row, and that's our kicker, Jake Elliott. Uh, Jake Elliott has been one of our best players, which is kind of sad when you really think about it, that our kicker is one of our best players. Uh, and ultimately, that's why, in, of those th options I was talking about earlier, I opted would have opted to try and kick the field goal and give Jake Elliott the chance to be the hero in that instance to try and win the game right there. I know it's longer than anything he's ever kicked before, but go ahead, give him a chance to try it. Uh, he's been one of our best players so far. He kicked a long one earlier. I'd go ahead and let Jake Elliott try for the win. Jake Elliott, my number one stud of the week. Let's go ahead and talk about who the duds of the week are, though. I've got plenty of them, and I've got actually have eight this week that I want to designate as duds of the week. Uh, and my number eight dud of the week is going to be Car. No, let's go ahead and get a head start and a false start on that and make number eight Matt Pryor. Matt Pryor likes to get head starts on everything, so we'll go ahead and list him first as the dud eight number eight dud of the week. So Matt Pryor, for that penalty, you're my number eight dud of the week. Of course, that takes them out of field goal range in Doug's mind. So for that reason, he's got to end up on the duds list. My number seven dud of the week is going to be Carson Wentz. Uh, you know, Wentz ends up uh, being a little lower on this list because he does then lead them on the drive to tie the game at the end of regulation. But too many mistakes earlier in this game. Another two interception game, both of which I think he has to have some blame for, regardless if the one is tipped or not. The other was a bad pass to the wrong shoulder for Zach Ertz and made it too easy on the defender. Uh, so Wentz, terrible game. He's my number seven dud of the week. My number six dud of the week is Jason Peters. He's just playing terrible this year. Uh, I don't know if bouncing him back and forth from guard to tackle was such a good idea, but Jason Peters, my number six dud of the week. My number five dud of the week is going to be Jalen Mills. Jalen Mills had a terrible game. How do you know when a guy in the secondary is not playing well? It's when he's the guy that gets sent on blitzes, when Jim Schwartz does decide to blitz. Uh, they send Mills because they know he's no good in coverage, so you might as well use him for something positive. Jalen Mills, my number five dud of the week. My number four dud of the week, I think I'm just going to give him a permanent place on this list. Has anyone seen J.J. Ortega-Whiteside? Because the only time I think I ever saw him was on a sideline shot. Um, and then it gets worse when later in the day you're watching D.K. Metcalf, and he's the guy they could have drafted instead of him. And he's having a great career. And I see Ortega-Whiteside all the time, and he's terrible. So he's going to continue to be on this list until he can prove he can do something. And that also goes for my number three dud of the week. I think I'm going to leave him on here permanently, Nate Gary. Uh, he is not an NFL linebacker and does not belong in a starting rotation. Uh, once again, made worse by the fact that Thursday night I see Camus Grugier-Hill make a great play for the Dolphins, and then Monday night I see uh, LJ Fort make a great play for the Ravens. And in both those instances, uh, those were guys we could have had, but no, we stuck with Nate Gary instead. He's a terrible uh, player. Maybe he could be, uh, be a guy who can play on special teams, but he is not a starting linebacker in the NFL. And as a result, until they realize that, he's probably going to continue to be on this list. Nate Gary, my number three dud of the week. And my number two dud of the week is going to be, number one, of course, obviously, was Doug Peterson. Number two is going to be the other coach. Jim Schwartz deserves to still be on this list. He still continues to call lousy game plans. That one play where we're on the sticks defense and they get the screen pass that goes for uh, 40 yards. Uh, you know, you're in a third and 15. That's what that sticks defense is designed to stop. So if you can't even run that right, you know, what are you even calling it for? Uh, where What happened to mixing in blitzes and all that kind of stuff? There's a reason why the Eagles have zero turnovers on defense this year, and it's because Jim Schwartz's defense is lousy. I've always hated it. I've never liked the way he calls defenses. And as a result, Jim Schwartz is my number two dud of the week. So there we go. That's where we are right now. Um, and, hey, those are the standings in the NFC least, as I'll call them. Uh, the, N the division has a combined record of 2-9-1. So the Eagles are only a half game out of first place. And because we tied, we actually gained ground in the division because everybody else lost. Uh, so the congratulations, this division winner is probably going to be below 500, which means the Eagles are probably going to be in the division race for most of the season. And maybe we can squeak it out at 7-8-1 or something stupid like that. But this team isn't going anywhere at all, so what's it really matter even if we do win the division? Um, 
So those are my thoughts. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments below. Is there anybody that deserves a stud of the week that I'm forgetting? Or are there any other guys that I didn't blame that you think deserve some of the blame for this loss? Leave your comments below. Let me know what you think. In the meantime, I'll go ahead and check in next weekend before the Sunday night game against the 49ers. Until then, fly Eagles fly, I guess.